Good morning. Uh, my name is Shujian Thompson. I'm with IBM. I'm the partner for cybersecurity and biometrics service area. Uh, today is a very exciting day. This is the panel of the event, so you're in the right spot. So let's go ahead and lock the door. Don't let anybody go out. <laughs> um, I think many of you would agree with me. You know, this is the, the, the cyber age. And um, with the increasing threat, that you and I both have to you know, consider not just bring in the machine intelligence, but also the human intelligence together to be able to counter the threat. Especially when we are observing the convergence of the needs to bring in cybersecurity, the physical security, the critical infrastructure security, human security, as well as the national security together to be able to counter the threat. So you are really up for a treat. Today in this panel, we brought in seasoned professionals to talk about their practice experience in their agencies. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start. So uh, first of all, let us uh, uh, introduce uh, each other. So Jamie, would you like to start? OK, uh, my name is Jamie Holt. I'm a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations. I started working for the government in 2000, um, started off as a Border Patrol agent on the border in Nogales, Arizona. Uh, I always wanted to become a special agent, so um, at the time I applied with U.S. Customs. 9-11 uh, happened, and so uh, U.S. Customs and Immigration converged, and we now became Homeland Security Investigations. Uh, I was a special agent out of Los Angeles for the last 10 years. Uh, worked at the airport, oversaw our undercover operations, as well as our uh, SAC intelligence program, um, and recently moved to headquarters in the last year and a half, where I was the chief of staff for the assistant director of intelligence, um, and now I am the unit chief over cybercrime. Outstanding. And Bruce? Sure. My name is Bruce Welsh. Uh, first of all, happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, I am also unit chief. Uh, over a cyber intelligence unit for the FBI. Uh, I started with the Bureau in 2004 after uh, I began my government, I guess, military career, uh, counterintelligence agent for 11 years. Uh, went into private industry, did international fraud and intellectual property investigations, and did international crisis planning and threat management for Capital One Financial. Uh, in 2004, I came uh, back to government service. The FBI was hiring a lot of analysts. I wasn't uh, I was not interested in being an agent at the time, uh, but I am very much into uh, analytics, and I've worked in a lot of different fields on the analysis front for the FBI, but uh, focused on cyber now for about the last four years, and uh, as uh, indicated by this session, clearly an issue for all of us, and uh, happy to be here. Outstanding. And again, I'm Sujan Thompson, I'm with IBM, and uh, my background is in the uh, large-scale data center uh, uh, management, data center consolidation, as well as the network engineering. Uh, evolved from the early time, working for the ISP, started uh, you know, obligated to be able to do the so-called um, forensic analysis for uh, the cyber crimes. And that's what led me into the cyber practices. And so working for Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, now with IBM, you have seen those cyber activities not just scattered in the civilian side, but also in the government side. So this is really the time called for a uniform ecosystem that we can then establish that the secure enclaves so we can operate and uh, share the intelligence together. So uh, first of all, that uh, you know, welcome to the panel. Uh, thank you, Jamie and Bruce, to take uh, to be able to uh, join us today. I know you are very busy, and the fact that you can travel through this really gloomy days and heavy traffic, so we really thank you for that. So, first question I have for you all here is that for you both here is the the cyber new era. I mean, many of us understand the advanced threat today is really is a pressing urgent. It's not just a national urgency, it really is a global agency, uh, global urgency now. So, would you please share your um, your perspective about the current cyber ecosystem and how your agency tie into this uh, cyber ecosystem and to overcome the cyber advanced threats. So Jamie, would you like to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, 
So I want to first start uh, with a little bit about Homeland Security investigations. Uh, I get a lot of questions about that just because there's the FBI, DEA, HSI, and a lot of people don't necessarily understand the differences. Um, so just to really simplify it, uh, anything that crosses the physical border or the virtual border, so going from one nation to another, um, is, falls within our purview uh, if it has some sort of nexus. So that's kind of how you can differentiate us between some of the other agencies. Um, Homeland Security investigations, because of our unique customs authorities, uh, really focused a lot on child exploitation. It used to come through the mail, and we worked very close with the uh, Postal Inspection Service. Uh, in 1997, we stood up the Cybercrime Center because we started to see a change from sending the child pornography through the mail to starting to transmit it over the internet. And so we wanted to address that problem. Um, as we've seen over the last 20 years, it's uh, changed quite a bit from just child exploitation over the internet with the onset of the dark net um, and a whole plethora of uh, issues and types of crime that have come into our purview. Uh, we've been working really hard to address a lot of those issues. Um, with regard to child exploitation, which is probably the crime that we're most seasoned in just because we've been doing it for so long. Uh, We've really focused not only on addressing the issue on the cyber side, but also in educating uh, the young people and going out and doing programs into the various schools is extremely important, as well as partnering with nonprofit organizations and private industry uh, to help us come up with some analytical solutions, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, one of the other things that we've seen a lot on the custom side is intrusion investigations. Um, I, and I don't know if some of you have heard this in the, in the media recently, um, but there was a port, uh, some hackers were able to infiltrate an IT system in a foreign port, and they were able to move large containers <clears throat> um, of contraband, make them disappear, um, and get their, their, um, their contraband, and then return the container. Uh, that has become problematic for our agency because one of our primary missions is to protect the homeland. We've also seen um, some hackers infiltrate some of the shipping industry. And <clears throat> when you hear about sometimes the pirates that go on the ships and take the, uh, the crew hostage and their intent is to get money. Uh, lately we've seen them actually board some of the ships, specifically go into those containers that have the high value items and then quickly depart. And so that was an indicator to us that they clearly have much more information than what we thought. And what they're doing is we now are seeing um, very uh, standardized criminal organizations going out and seeking the assistance from hackers or cyber criminals to infiltrate their IT systems. And it's for agencies and organizations that didn't necessarily think that they would be targeted. And so we're working very closely with our foreign partners right now to um, explain to them the importance of communication, especially in the customs realm, with their various industry partners to make sure that their information is protected. Outstanding. And Bruce? So looking at it from the, the intelligence side and reviewing uh, the cyber ecosystem, which uh, topic-wise, you know, the full components that make up the cyber ecosystem, I would characterize them two ways in our current view, growing and unsecure. So um, if you look at, you know, there are secure enclaves to your point, um, and we're trying to make it more secure, but I think it's a falsehood to believe anybody, to believe that your system is truly secure any more than the five minutes you're looking at it. Um, you know, the capabilities of a single, to so some of the, the points that, and were just made, the single hacker can do things that were never thought of uh, years ago. And then you just keep going, whether it be an organized criminal element, whether it be nation state sponsored terrorist organization, the capabilities expand even more. And there are so many vulnerabilities, some of them not even yet known, uh, throughout the cyber ecosystem that to think in a term of using secure in any form or facet I, I think is a misnomer. So from a defender standpoint and understanding uh, the environment, uh, we 
constantly have outreach efforts. Um, the FBI has 56 field offices. So there are local outreach efforts and there's outreach efforts uh, from the headquarters level to organizations likely that exist in this room today, um, as well as government, private, individuals, uh, depending on who they may be, in sharing uh, jointly with DHS or individually or with other agencies indicators of vulnerabilities that exist in the cyber ecosystem, whether it has to do with software, hardware, uh, individuals, groups, um, uh, you know, company infrastructure. Uh, so there's all kinds of different areas there on the ecosystem front uh, that we do our best to interact on, that we do our best to leverage things from you and try to share back what we can uh, to make us all, again, striving towards uh, a more secure environment, but understanding that it's not secure for any length of time in its current state. Very good. Well, I think we would agree, you know, you, you no longer can just secure your home front without having the, uh, the, the ecosystem realized and established their relationships. So really intriguing challenges uh, from the different uh, perspective. Well, I'm sure that you have many of the best practices, that the experiences and lessons learned that you can share. Would you uh, mind if you can uh, pick a few or, you know, of best practices that in your agency that you have, uh, you, you have experienced that have, you know, have the uh, uh, ability to be able to overcome the advanced threats and uh, you know how you'll be able to leverage that experience and then further enhance your cyber posture and cyber capability. So how about we this time we go with Bruce uh, to start to answer this question. So from a use case, so from an overall, um, and, and I think this, tr this is a transferable thought to each of your organizations, companies, um, Organization of information and your intelligence or your data um, is key to be able to look at who may have done it, how they did it, things, the whole uh, gambit of interrogatives that we need to answer whenever there's an event. Um, we, I know the, there's a holistic movement um, in the government to go to, there's a cyber threat framework that's being worked that I was a part of uh, during a stint with uh, the Director of National, National Intelligence uh, that's trying to organize data in a way that we can, you know, I mentioned before, leveraging what's going on in private industry and being able to share back things. The only way that works, and this, this again, I'll say it's transferable to inside your organization, is we all speak the same language that we use the same definitions for things and we characterize what threats are out there the same way. Without being able to do that, um, we collectively can't really, we fight the cyber threat or we defend against it or we try to prevent it in an ad hoc way. Uh, if we can do it collectively, which is what we're trying to do through leverage and outreach and things like that, we have you know, like in most senses in, in life, you have a better chance of success. So I would first say that a focal area inside every organization should be organization communication at the same level, the same way, and understanding the same things. Uh, you know, these are the challenges we run into everything. You know, cyber's no different. Uh, you know, communication, good communication means that you're able to talk get your message across, and it's actually received by the other side the way that you intended it to be. I mean, we have to fight that every day in life. You know, I talk to my kids, and I'm trying to get them to listen to what I'm saying. So we, we all have that issue. But it's because of the timeliness associated with cyber um, and the remoteness of your adversary, it's got to be there. I mean, there has to be organized methods in the way that you defend, you prevent, you react, uh, all those kind of things, kind of what we'll get to be, uh, later about resiliency. They have to be in place because you don't have time to make them up as you go. So I, I would just stress that point. Uh, if you take away anything else, I'm sure you've already thought of this, so I, I'm probably not stating something that's not, uh, you know, something brand new to you, but I, I would really stress that point. And, you know, we are open when we do outreach to figure out ways, hey, best practices that you have or best practices we have. Again, mentioning 
in the Bureau itself, we have different tools that are under development in organizing data, tagging data, that will assist us to be better able to analyze and figure out and answer all those basic interrogatives associated with any sort of threat that we see a lot quicker than we do now. Outstanding. I think the partnership goes both ways and the industry side also are seeking for opportunity to partner with the government so we can share the best practices and the advanced technologies and the, you know, the practice experience. So thank you for that, uh, making that point. And Jamie, how about talk about the best practices in the uh, Department of Homeland Security side? So um, one of the things that I, I wanted to I guess in part is the amount of data that's available online nowadays that um, we don't necessarily realize. You know, there's a lot of data that individuals are posting online, but there's a lot of metadata, metadata that's um, in all of that additional data. And so last year, Homeland Security Investigations, um, we seized almost six petabytes of data. So just to kind of give you a perspective of that, that's about 77 years of high definition video to review. Uh, we have a little over 6,000 agents and we have 300 forensics analysts. So trying to review all of that data and understand where all the pieces fit together is a bit of an impossible job. Um, a lot of that data is related to child exploitation and child pornography. And uh, we recognize that it was a significant problem. We had a nine month backlog on trying to review all of the computers and the data um, to look through these images. And so we recognized this was a problem. We reached out to our industry partners. We reached out to nonprofit organizations, relaying to them that this was one of our issues. And uh, they ended up coming up with a great solution. Uh, it's called Project Vic. And essentially what it does is when we seize a computer, let's say there was 100,000 images on that computer we have a program that will automatically kind of cull through all of that data and separate images that have already been identified. And then that may only leave, you know, 300,000 images for an agent to go through and try to identify additional victims. It was extremely important to our organization because it cut down the amount of time that we are analyzing the data. Um, so I think that it was a great example of using analytics to be able to make our job easier. Not only did it, in, um, it cut down our time to about a month now, our backlog is about a month, and not only did it help us identify victims in a more timely manner, but it also um, was for the betterment of the agents and the forensic analysts that are reviewing the data. The images are very graphic and can be uh, very detrimental to an individual. And so when you can cut down on reviewing that, those amount of images, it's better for their overall health. Um, so that was one of the examples that I thought of that for an analytical tool that really um, helped us out. A couple of other things that we're looking at is RICO charges. Um, we have a lot of issues with underground marketplaces on the dark net and the punishment um, isn't always a huge deterrent. So if you only get a year or two for committing the crime, um, it's not much of a deterrent. And so we've started to look at RICO charges to charge them as an organization where the criminals will receive more significant time in jail and that has sent um, a better message. So we've had some positive experiences with that in our carding sites. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about um, was also regard to the underground marketplaces and how they pop back up. So one of the challenges for law enforcement is the victim can be in one location, the perpetrator can be in another country, and the server can be yet in another country. And so, um, it's been a challenge for us, but I think one of the positives that has come about is it has increased collaboration with foreign partners. Historically, when we've shared information, it's been very slow, but cyber has really pushed the government agencies to start working closer together in a more timely manner because we recognize it needs to be addressed in a more timely manner. Well, I think this is an, a domain that we all understand the complexity is so great. And uh, so it's really not just, like I say in the early on, it's not just the machine intelligence that we have to integrate with human intelligence all together. Especially now, we would all agree, if you look at the different dimensions of the you know, advanced threats, this is not just a one dimension or two dimension, this is multiple facets of dimension that we are dealing with, including, you know, just name it from physical security to critical infrastructure security, information security, now human security, the 
and mental stability, the, the human vulnerability, play a big you know, uh, 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 impact to our uh, advanced threats. In addition to that is now the security really has become national security issues as well. So with all these different dimensions of security, you look at the machine learning, critically important, but how do you best at leveraging machine learning? I think we all talk about, touch upon a little bit in that regard. You may have a very strong analytical engine, however, the injection of the, the appropriate data at the right time, the right format, allowing us to be able to yield that advanced threat you know, in, a, in a timely manner and be able to you know, design and test out the countermeasures so we can take the informative actions. However, we all understand we can only, if we only count the machine learning, we're never going to gain that power that we need. So cognitive capabilities as well as the so-called, you know, the cyber range, human inject, you know, and translate the threat so we can take the appropriate mission uh, impact analysis and take the appropriate actions. So if you would, uh, in the next question here is that with all, the, with all these different dimensions of cyber threats in mind, and the different threat conditions, either in cyber or non-cyber, you know, how your agency integrate the different uh, dimensions to be able to achieve that overall mission appropriate cyber resilience capabilities to be able to protect our nation as well as protect your agency. So who would like to start? Okay, um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right, um, so just in, in thinking about this question with regard to the human dimension, um, I know I just talked about our Project VIC program. Uh, we, have, we have an issue with the amount of data that we need to review. Um, and so one of the things that we, we did was, again, we coordinated with our nonprofit and we reached out to the military. And we now have a program which is called the HERO program. And we coordinate with SOCOM and PROTECT and we uh, bring in military folks that um, have been injured, uh, they're veterans. They come into our agency, we provide them training, forensic training on how to review all of the data that we seize. They do a one year internship with our agency. And then for the most part, our agency has been able to hire about 80% of those individuals. And we've been able to, um, or some of those other individuals have been able to encounter jobs in other uh, sectors of the market. This was really important to us because we've seen several of the the wounded warriors, you know, they took the fight to the battlefield over in, over in foreign governments, and now they're back in the US and they still have that fight in them. They still want to be a part of a team effort. And so being able to work with these different agencies and bring them on board has been a huge advantage to our agency and has also benefited the veterans. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at is recruiting. Uh, there seems to be a significant focus on cybersecurity, and we see that in a lot of the universities, but there's not a lot of focus on cybercrime, and they're two different things. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been pushing our recruiters to reach out to the different colleges and develop different programs that focus on cybercrime as well as cybersecurity. Uh, on the informational side, uh, we see a lot of vendors come out to uh, the Cybercrime Center on a regular basis. And this is kind of one thing that I would like to challenge to our private industry partners. Um, a lot of the tools or solutions are kind of operate in a stovepipe. So I may have, you know, one vendor may be able to sell me a translation capability. One vendor may be able to sell me um, a dark net scraping capability. Another one, you know, will scrape the clear net for information but they aren't all integrated. And it takes a lot of time for the human to sit there and process all of that information within each individual tool. Um, so if that's one thing that I could um, put forth to, as a challenge to some of our private industry partners is um, we, there's a lot of focus on specializing certain tools, but being able to integrate them and making it easier for the individual to be able to you know, add all the information that they want to search and be able to do it simultaneously with multiple tools would be a huge advantage to the government agencies. On the physical side, um, I fo we focus a lot on undercover networks. Um, again, Homeland Security Investigations, our primary focus is not cybersecurity, it's cybercrime. And so being able to give our agents in the field uh, the tools and equipment they need to conduct undercover operations is extremely important. With regard to national security, 
because we because of our unique customs authority um, you're trying to protect the homeland from items coming in and out of the u.s uh, we've seen because of the underground marketplaces we've seen a significant increase with the narcotics um, a huge cause for concern for national security has been passports or identification documents that you can obtain online and some of the ways that we're using analytical tools um, is to constantly readdress, readdress or reassess our uh, targeting tools um, to address those packages coming in and out of the country. Uh, we are also conducting a lot of online undercover operations to identify individuals that are trying to per perpetrate this sort of criminal behavior. Um, and then, of course, collaboration with other U.S. government agencies and foreign agencies. Great. Um, Bruce. Um, ditto. Uh, I mean, the FBI is mainly an investigative agency as well, so not a lot of cybersecurity uh, side, more on the cybercrime issue, whether, you know, across the gambit of every type of cybercrime, because all the activities that are, that are conducted can be considered criminal, um, you know, even if it does involve national security. Um, the biggest things from that side, as far as an integration standpoint goes, uh, internal to the agency, Everything's integrated, whether it be the criminal investigative division, the counterintelligence division, the cyber division, although they're separate divisions, they're all integrated at some level, and that includes in the field offices. Uh, we have different task force, uh, we have uh, cyber task force in every field office that on the integration front, that does include other agencies, it includes local law enforcement and local uh, uh, government agencies. So from an integration side um, of all the different aspects of security, if you want to put them in the information security bucket or the physical security bucket uh, or cybersecurity bucket for that matter, uh, everything is integrated internal to the agencies. Uh, as events occur, there are meetings that take place. What do they involve? As soon as an initial assessment's done, then it's shared between those that are relevant, uh, the different agencies or personnel analytics go, investigations go jointly, uh, again, trying to answer all those basic interrogatives. Um, it can be event-driven, whether it be theft of PII or major criminal investigation or, uh, you know, Bitcoin fraud. I mean, you, the, the types of different activities and events on a criminal side in the cyber realm that involve all those different aspects of security are all fully integrated internally. Now we, I think I mentioned the Internet uh, IC3, the Internet Criminal Complaint Center is a outward facing part of the Bureau where if you were to find something uh, that you needed to report as far as being a victim, whether it be agency or whether it be individual, that's a place you can call and report something. Something that gets taken in by the Bureau that way then gets filtered out to all those different divisions to try to figure out and work together where that stands. Uh, again, answer all the basic interrogatives from an investigative standpoint and what needs to take place uh, to follow that up. Uh, you know, clearly on the cyber side, um, information security would probably rank the highest, although, uh, you know, if you were going to rank them one against the other, um, as far as relating directly to cyber. but. Um, from the security side, again, we, you know, we're an investigative agency. We go out and we try to figure out who did it. Um, not so much, although we do give indicators and, and the outreach efforts I mentioned before, in the prevention side to assist in development of security uh, practices and procedures across all gambits, informational, cyber, uh, human security, physical security, uh, to help each agency or each uh, entity, I should say, uh, develop those processes and procedures that work best for you. Great. Well, I think, uh, why don't we do this? Uh, we'll let the uh, audience uh, ask questions. So um, I think there's a microphone going to go around. So any questions for the panelists uh, or myself? Yes. Good morning. I'm from DHS as well. <laughs> um, in reference to the um, social media and being monitored and, and working with the partners, industry partners, to get that collaboration that we're all in it together for the security of the nation, how do you, I know you re talked about the outreach, but how do you really get um, the public sector and the government to work together in reference to like the Facebook monitoring? You know, we can, um, I know you said, you know, a lot of 
lot of images out there, a lot of metadata, and a lot of resources needed to monitor the Facebook and all those different social websites. How can we, you know, get the importance out there that we're all in it together, that we need to help each other um, protect our nation in reference to, you know, cracking the Apple phone and all those good things and, and, and not having to go overseas and ask for help for another nation or so forth. So just your position on that. Um. That's a great question. <laughs> um, it's been a, there's been a lot of discussion surrounding that in my office as well. Um, you know, I, I think that sometimes we need to focus on things that we agree on as opposed to things that we disagree on. Um, and that's one thing that uh, in my 15 years with the government that I've learned in working with the private sector, right? Instead of going there and demanding, hey, we need this, this, and this, we try to say, okay, this, these are the things that we need. Where can we meet in the middle? Um, and, and usually that's how we gain our support with the private sector. I think there needs to be a larger discussion nationwide on um, looking at differences between anonymity and privacy and being respectful of privacy. Um, I don't think it's a great position for the US government to come in and sit to a private industry and say, you will do this or you will do that. You know, we're a people or we're a government that's made up by the people and for the people. And so there needs to be a broader discussion um, amongst everyone to say, what is it that we really want? You know, as a parent, I can say that if there was harm being done to my child or to a family member, and the information to be able to solve that crime was in a laptop or a phone or a tablet, from a personal perspective, I absolutely would want the government and that private industry partner to have the capability to get into that. You know, likewise, I also enjoy the encryption and the ability of having all of my information safe on my various devices. Um, so I, you know, the FBI, and, and, and I'll let Bruce speak to that, but the FBI has been doing a great job of trying to um, engage the public in this type of conversation. I know the director has been very vocal about it. Um, and I do think that it is a conversation that we need to continue to have, but I'm not sure that it's, uh, the right position for the government to come in and say, you know, you must do this. It's a decision by the people. And if enough people say, you know what, we, we want to, um, we want private industry to provide access to that information, then, you know, that will, that will be pursued. Want so, to add the uh, FBI perspective? <laughs> so I, I won't, I won't go too far into the whole thing with Apple and the, and phone situation. However, I, you know, the main argument that people come up with and need to understand is the greater good argument. Okay, But the greater good argument is two things. One, it's two-sided, uh, and it's also uh, situational. So if we can set some sort of, or come to an agreement on some sort of guidelines to objectively address each situation, and determine with a wider range, let the people decide, the greater good in this situation is, uh, and let it be that situation, deal with it, and move on. See, every, most of the concerns are precedent setting. You know, if we do this, it sets a precedent this way. If we do this, it's a, well, true, but if you go in with the thought process of it being situational in the first place, I don't think you have to go too far down that road, and then you don't get into all the discussions other than that specific situation, whether you're gonna have issues with violation of rights and all those other questions. But we, you know, there's always that, if you leave it ambiguous, you leave yourself open to all the arguments coming forward and you really don't get anywhere to tell you the truth. And then it makes the argument null and void, which I'm sure some parties are, are fine with. Um, so it's really a question of, do you wanna advance the argument or not? And I, I think, I will say one thing for the Bureau, I think, and going on top of what was just said, that that's what the Bureau wanted to do. Let's advance the argument and let's see where we end up with that. And then we know where the boundaries are going forward. Uh, and on a, I'm not sure, you know, we didn't get there from what I understand in this case, but I, I think that's where it needs to go in these sorts of situations. Um, but it's my thoughts. Great. Any other question? Please do. Um, can we please uh, wait for the microphone so we can hear? Um, 
is the discussion around encryption and the use of encryption, uh, is it being driven from the state and local level where they have fewer resources than the federal government? You know, that's my impression of what's going on. It's really the state and local uh, law enforcement um, that doesn't have the uh, same capabilities that the federal government does, and therefore they're trying to push this conversation up because they would like somebody else to be able to do this work for, on their behalf so that they could actually, you know, potentially serve a warrant or whatnot. I, I would guess that that be true. Um, not having been directly involved in any of that uh, uh, or hearing those concerns voiced to me in particular, I don't know that it exists, but there would be a, a common sense approach that that would exist. And like in any other situation, if I don't have the resources to do it and I have to rely on you, I would hope that you would further the argument on my behalf, but I don't know that it exists in this case. Um, I would say that it's... Obviously, it's a problem with state and locals because they do have less resources, but it, it's not just driven by them. You know, as a federal agency, we encounter that problem on a regular basis, and we have been doing so for years. I personally have experienced it. Um, so I don't think it's just a state and local um, partner. You know, I think it involves everyone. But what I've seen over time is, you know, historically, it would just happen you know, in an instance here or an instance there, and law enforcement was able to get around it with some, some sort of piece of evidence, or they were able to figure something else out to be able to prosecute the individual. But um, with the increase in frequency of using tablets and phones um, as a, you know, a primary way of communication, um, a lot more evidence is held into those various devices. And so it has made it much more predominant in both states, um, federal and local investigations where we're not able to get that information and, you know, either save a child or, um, you know, get the appropriate evidence to convict an individual or perhaps provide, um, obtain evidence to identify, you know, a killer or a kidnapper or whatever it is. Just the frequency of those types of investigations has escalated so much that it's just come to the forefront where we need to have a serious conversation with the, with the people about what do they want. And then you have situations like, you know, the one that we're talking about as far as the terror stuff where the, the stakes are higher, right. at least, uh, you know, f both from an investigative standpoint, but as well at, as a public uh, standpoint, too. And, you know, that increases all the, uh, all the activity around it. Any other questions? Well, I do have a question here is that uh, in light of this really needed partnership, either from the public sector or from the government side, do you see more and more perhaps venues would be created, allowing the public sector and the government to create more collaboration, some sort of uh, maybe alliances activities or some kind of joint research development or joint ex uh, exploring uh, new technologies or new operational concepts that perhaps in the public sector have proven successful, can then share the best practice with the government. Any uh, insight to share in that regard? So, so DHS, uh, we have a, a component called DHS Science and Technology. And the various component, components within DHS work very closely with DHS Science and Technology. And it's great because DHS Science and Technology um, works very closely with the public partners and private industry. And they're able to conduct different trials to see how their systems or tools would be able to enhance the government. Um, they're able to um, do a lot of research on behalf uh, of the different components because we don't necessarily have the time and resources to be able to do that. So on behalf of DHS, I will say that they're a huge tool and asset um, and if your company is interested in engaging more with the government, um, that would definitely be an organization that you want to reach out to because uh, we talk to them several times a week, um, all the time. Right? They're just a fantastic resource. So that would, that's what I would say on behalf of DHS. The DHS s and yes. organization, got it. How about FBI? So I know for FBI, and you know, I'll put in a plug for our outreach, um, our outreach section, for cyber division anyway, um, they're definitely open and they will solicit uh, um, 
at every venue that they attend um, in you know, best practices back from private industry. Uh, and also work hard to, you know, we spoke about integration, trying to integrate methods, uh, you know, things that successes for you, successes for us, share those back and forth and see how we, you know, like I mentioned in the first part, trying to get everybody on the same page and talking the same language as much as possible because collectively we can move forward in trying to get to a secure, uh, different secure environments in the ecosystem. Um, but ad hoc wise, we don't make a lot of strides. So, you know, th that's definitely a mindset for the cyber division outreach program. Um, FBI as a total or in whole, uh, you know, their, their public affairs, I'm sure can share some uh, uh, response back on the best way to get better integrated with the Bureau holistically um, and working together or relationship wise. Outstanding. Any other questions from the audience? Well, on behalf of IBM, I want to thank both of you for your time today and then your services to our country. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate that, Bruce. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming to this panel. Thank you.